Ink Ribbon. After the third and final Resident Evil film made a buttload of money, the trilogy was expanded, and we naturally got a fourth film. Since I already covered the first three films in the series, I figured we may as well go all the way, so buckle up and get ready. From exploding cameras to removing Leon, here are 50 facts about Resident Evil Afterlife. The opening scene where the infection begins in Tokyo is set four years before the main plot of the film begins. This is the first Resident Evil film to actually shoot in all the locations depicted, being Tokyo, Los Angeles, and Alaska. Aside from lining up with the games, one of the reasons the more mutated monsters such as the Magini zombies and the dogs have heads that open up was mainly because due to Alice's abilities the zombies wouldn't really pose much of a threat anymore and were no longer scary. The film's music was scored by the New York based music duo Tom and Andy who have scored several famous horror movies including The Mothman Prophecies, The Hills Have Eyes, and The Strangers. Ali Larder reprised her role as Claire and ended up missing several episodes of Heroes due to her scheduling conflicts caused by this film. Even though Spencer Locke reprises her role as Kmart and is featured, she does not have any lines of dialogue other than her flashbacks, which are just recycled footage from the third film. Jensen Ackles was in negotiation to play the role of Leon Kennedy, but they fell through and Leon's character was written out and switched for Chris instead. This is also the only film in the franchise to feature Chris, even though he is a prominent character in the games. There are originally plans to have flashback sequences to elaborate on Chris and Claire's relationship and depict Claire in Raccoon City looking for him, but the scenes were later scrapped. Wentworth Miller, star of Prison Break, got nervous when he saw the script because his character starts in a prison cell and the first lines in both the show and this movie are, I know a way out of here. Sean Roberts, who plays Wesker, originally auditioned for the role of Chris Redfield, but lost it to Wentworth Miller, later being cast as Wesker instead. When Claire is running from the Axeman and he swings at her, this was done as a visual reference to Code Veronica, when Claire is running from Steve. During the fight with Wesker and the Redfields, when Wesker flips Claire, you can see the TCR timecode on the bottom left corner was accidentally left in for one single frame. The principal photography went fast and smooth, taking only 55 days of shooting to complete. After seeing James Cameron's Avatar, Paul Anderson and his crew were convinced to do the film in 3D and spent weeks learning how to use the 3D cameras. Using them added about 20% to the budget, but also marked it as the first video game adapted film to be filmed in 3D. Because of the weight of the cameras, they weren't able to attach them to a normal rig, so they had to have several custom-made motion control rigs just for their needs. Another interesting challenge the 3D cameras added was the inability to properly capture metal or anything reflective due to flares causing issues, so almost everything in the movie that looks like metal was specifically painted to look like metal but to not be shiny or reflective. The fight between Wesker and the Redfields has fight choreography lifted almost shot for shot from his fight with Chris and Sheva in Resident Evil 5. A lot of the shots you see in the movie were specifically designed to enhance the 3D experience. Obviously there are things flying at the camera, but there was also other things that captured spatial depth, like the underwater scenes, scenes with smoke, and of course, the famous shower room fight. All of the external shots of the Arcadia were filmed while the ship was docked, with all of the docks being digitally removed later. In the action sequence with the Alice clones, they constantly go between wearing high heels and flats. When Claire is found, she's horribly dirty and grimy, but in the next scene, she's on the plane, fresh and clean. During the shower fight scene when Claire kills the axe man, the axe goes from being up in the air to resting on its base next to him. While planning out the shots where she plays all the clones, Mila came up with different characters and mannerisms for each one, which you'll notice if you look carefully, with some clones having different facial expressions while fighting and even throwing grenades in slightly different ways. Unsurprisingly, blowing up Tokyo was seen as controversial, so it was decided that instead of a traditional bomb, Wesker would use an implosion instead. The journal that was shown from the third movie had actually been auctioned off to a collector, and when they realized they were doing a fourth film, they requested to borrow it for the movie, which the collector kindly obliged, and it was used in the fourth film as well. 
Part of the reason for including Tokyo in this film was because when pitching the first movie, Paul Anderson and his team had to fly to Osaka, Japan to meet with Capcom, and they fell in love with Japan. It wasn't until this film that they were finally able to incorporate it into the movie. The pod-looking stations that Wesker commands at the beginning are not set pieces, but actually real things at Toronto University. In reality, they are a coffee bar for professors, though the floors were changed and the coffee machines were removed. The look and feel of Alice in her plane was directly inspired by Amelia Earhart. The theme for the weapons in this film is all classic and iconic western weapons, including revolvers and sawed-off shotguns loaded with quarters. This was juxtaposed with Japanese weaponry such as throwing knives and katanas. This was the first film to feature Smith & Wesson's new 460 Magnum revolver, which became the second most powerful production handgun in the world after the 500 Smith & Wesson Magnum. After working with dogs and makeup for three movies in a row, it was decided to be too much of an issue, so instead, full body costumes were made for the dogs. During one of the days of filming, the producers noticed hundreds of screaming fans had gathered around waiting for actors to arrive, and eventually they realized it was mostly girls lined up to catch a glimpse of Boris Kujo, who plays Luther. This was when the producers learned he was a pretty big deal in Canada. Speaking of Boris, he trained very hard to do his own stunts, but ended up twisting his ankle in a scene where he was kicking a gate. At the end of the shower fight, when Mila shoots towards the screen, she accidentally destroyed a $100,000 camera by shattering it, which if you pause, you can actually see the damage just before they cut away. In the bloopers, you can see the full moment it happened, along with Ali Larder's reaction to it. Even though Ali Larder has worn a ponytail many, many times, she doesn't wear her hair in a ponytail in any movie of the franchise, even though it's Claire's iconic hairstyle. She was, however, not a fan of dyeing her hair red. The interior of the Arcadia was inspired by the look of a lot of 70s sci-fi films, but led to a lot of delays due to the floor constantly needing to be repainted after being walked on due to scuff marks and footprints from not only the actors, but the crew as well. The underwater shots were very murky, but this was actually an accident. Even though the sets were painted with waterproof paint, the paint wasn't dry enough, so when they flooded the sets, all the paint came off, not only making the water murky, but making it very difficult to film since they couldn't see the actors if they were more than two feet away from the camera. In the deleted scenes, there's a full close-up shot depicting the entire process of how Alice makes her shotgun rounds out of quarters. This was Mila Jovovich's first time doing a Resident Evil film as a mother. This is also the first Resident Evil film to not feature any nudity. Extinction was meant to be the third and final film to make Resident Evil into a trilogy, but the producers, as well as Sony, couldn't resist continuing it, so they ordered a fourth film. This is also why there was three years between the third and fourth film being released. Afterlife was originally the working title for the third film, but that film's name was changed to Extinction, with Afterlife being used for this one instead. For some reason, this is the only film in the franchise to not have a novel adaptation. You can't really tell on film, but the shots in Alaska where Alice finds Claire were actually miserable filming conditions, mainly due to the non-stop rain. The ground was extremely muddy, which not only meant that it was cold and wet, but also, every time the actors fell on the ground, they had to completely change wardrobe and do their hair and makeup again. Even though he wrote the script for all four movies up until this point, this was only Paul Anderson's second time directing a Resident Evil film. The woman shown during the Tokyo segment that zombifies is actually a famous Japanese singer named Mika Nakashima, who has sold over 10 million records in Japan. This film grossed over $300 million worldwide, making it the highest grossing Canadian film ever and also the highest grossing entry in the franchise until the sixth film. Paul Anderson originally wrote the script to end on an optimistic note, but the studio execs wanted a more intense cliffhanger for an ending, so the massive oncoming attack was added to leave the film open-ended, and was directly inspired by the giant pull-away shot from the first film. During the credits, there is a short final scene that teases the return of Sienna Guillory as Jill Valentine. This was also the very first scene that was shot for the film. When Paul Anderson reached out to her to reprise her role as Jill, she was ecstatic to do it and arrangements to shoot were made immediately. 
And that is it for this video. If you like this video, then please fire a round of quarters into that like button. I'm really enjoying including video game films in my rotation of videos, so I'm thinking of adding some other game-based movies into this series. And if you have any that you'd like me to cover, please let me know in the comments so that I can watch and research them. I hope you have a great day, and if you've been sitting for a few hours, this is a great time to step away from some screens, stand up, and stretch your legs. Until next time, I'm Kai Morgan, and as always, thanks for watching Ink Ribbon. And a very special thank you to all of my Patreon supporters and YouTube members. Your extra support means the world to me and helps me keep making content for you guys.